The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Jason Hart. You are significant. Every single one of you are significant. In some way, you are significant. The reason why you are significant is because you point to something. You are a sign that points to something else. We're all like a hunting dog. That when there is a... a when there is a bird to be pointed out, we point to it. We give a sign to it. And we are all pointing to something. And whatever it is that we are pointing to is what gives us our significance. Now, it could be that we are pointing to ourselves. It's as if we have a sign that says, here I am. Or it could be that we are pointing to something else. Here is, and whatever that may be. And so when I ask you this morning, what are you pointing to? And obviously, is the sign that you are wearing one that points to God one that points to Jesus and says, Here is God. I am in Him. It is He who gives me my significance. It is He that gives me my worth it is He that gives me my identity. It is He who gives me my purpose. Now, whatever it is that we point to is what we are saying and suggesting gives us significance. But are you pointing to God? If you would, please turn over your Bibles to John at chapter 1. Whenever we take a look at the Gospel of John, John's intent is to point us to Jesus. That was his significance. When we look at John the Baptist, we see a man who was sent by God to serve a special purpose, a special ministry. And he was to point to Jesus. Now, John begins his record of the life of Jesus in a unique way, somewhat different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Instead, he appeals to the creation. And this is one of the reasons why I think the Gospel of John is so special. I'm so thankful that this has been preserved for us by the providence of God. John, being a man who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words in the beginning. You look back to the very first verse of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God. Everything about God, everything about this creation, everything about us begins with, In the beginning, God. And God created, God took initiative, and He created the heavens and the earth. He made a creation. And the crowning of His creation was a man who was made in His own image, a woman who was made in His own image. And John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word. Your words 
represent you. Your words are an identification of your thought process, of your movement, of your desires, your ambitions. Everything about you can be heard in your words. And in the the beginning, the Genesis account, God spoke the world into existence. He spoke and it was created. He spoke and it was divided. He spoke and He made man in His own image. And He breathed into Him, into His nostrils, the breath of life. Life is a connection to God. Life is not just about existence. Most of the time we think about life, we think about being a person who is existing. And when we think about eternal life, we think of existing forever. And whereas there is some truth to that, it goes much deeper. You see, in the creation, God planted a garden for His creation to live within, His special creation, Adam and Eve. And in that garden... There were several trees planted, but there were two two special trees planted. One was the tree of life, and one was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Both of those were gifts from God. They were blessings. And we may wonder, why in the world was the tree of knowledge, how is that a blessing? Because if they ate of it, they would die. It was a blessing because it was choice. For man to know that he was not a robot, but that he had a choice. He could choose between life and death. He could choose between blessing and a cursing. He could choose to eat from the tree of life and continue to live. But what was that life? That life was walking with God. It was connection with the creator of the universe. So that's what it's all about. Connection with God. And that's where man found his true worth in the Garden of Eden was in that connection with God who is the giver of life. And if man ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then he would die. He would be separated. Everything that God hates is a separation. Man was separated from walking with God in the garden when sin entered into the picture. John says, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him. In Him was life. Not just existence. He and the Father and the Spirit were all one. So interwoven together that there was no separation in them. And in Him was life. So, obviously, when man was separated from God, there was no longer life, there was death. But in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Look back into the creation. What did God separate? He separated the light from the darkness, didn't he? The true light, skipping down to verse 9, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. And the Word became flesh.
Can we say, wow? The word, the word became flesh. He took on the role of a servant. He gave up the pleasures and the treasures of heaven to come to this earth in the poverty of flesh so that we might be rich. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Down to verse 16. And from Him, or from His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Grace on top of grace. If God has ever been gracious to mankind before, now He has His grace on top of grace. For the law was given through Moses. That was a gracious gift. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. And folks, that's just the beginning of the Gospel of John. And what is the end of the Gospel of John, and what we see in, in John chapter 20 and verses 31 and 32, is that John wrote these things so that we may believe in that believing, that we may believe in His name and, and have life. Everything about the Gospel of John is a story of the Creator. And now He is acting in a new way within His much-loved creation. He became flesh. And in doing so, He ushered in a new creation. To be the image He intended it to be. Everybody has worth of some sort. But true worth can only be found in bearing the image of God. And finding our life in Him, which is the only place where we can find our true worth. When we think about a person's worth, their significance, we normally think about it being a person's identity or their purpose. Let's think for just a moment just about identity. We normally think about a, a person's uh, worth as being measured by their chosen path. Now, their career choice in life. That may be that they decided to go to college after high school, or maybe they went into the military, or they decided to go into the workforce. Or maybe they decided to have a family. And sometimes we think of a person's worth as being that of their knowledge, their intellect. It's not necessarily measured by the degrees or the number of degrees that a person has. Some people are very intelligent when it comes to certain crafts. When it comes to talents, when it comes to particular works of service. Or we would think about a person's worth as being measured by their strength. Some individuals are extremely strong. And sometimes it's not just physical. I have a great admiration of those who are emotionally strong. Who can be able to withstand much of the pressures of the world. I, I envy that. And that's how we normally measure a person's worth. This is what Jesus says, though. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. And Jesus lays out. Now, remember in John chapter 15, verse 1, He says, I am the true vine. Not a representative of God, not something that is pointing to God, not something that is pointing to life, not something that is pointing to bread, not something that is pointing to truth, 
I am the vine. He clarified his significance. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, this is where you will find true worth in me. When we accept that we will only find true worth in Jesus, well, let's take a look at John chapter 14 and verses 18 to 21. We will first of all see Him with the eye of faith. I believe John mentioned that last week as in, in prayer or in the, the Scripture reading that he had before prayer. We see Him with the eye of faith. Beginning in verse 16, I will not leave you as orphans, he tells his disciples who were very troubled because Jesus was about to go away. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. You will see me. You'll see the way. Then he says, Because I live, you also live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest him to myself. Three things right here. Notice, we will see him in faith. We will see him in faith. That is the way. We will know him deeply. We will know the Father just as the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows His. Jesus is the truth. The only way that we can know the Father, the only way that we can see the Father, is through Him. And we will live with His new life. Do you remember John chapter 1? In Him was what? Life. We'll only find our identity in God. We will only find our identity in Jesus. For without Jesus, you have no true worth. Now understand, I've already said, you are significant in some way. You have worth. But without Jesus, you have no worth, no true worth. Because without Jesus, there is real, no real access to or connection with the Father who gives you your new creation identity. Do you get that? Now, I'm, I'm saying something extremely important to you. That you may be worthy as an individual. You may be worthy as a businessman. You may be worthy as a teacher. You may be worthy as a banker. You may be worthy as a factory worker. You can be worthy as a father or as a mother or as a son, but you will only have true worth when your identity is found in Jesus. Because it is only in Jesus that the Father through Jesus gives you your new creation identity. Now we said before that a person's worth can be measured by their identity, but also by their purpose. Let's move on to the purpose. Jesus says in this wonderful parable, I am the vine, verse 1. And he says, this is your purpose in me. Of all the virtues written in the Gospel of John for our benefit, this is the highest virtue, because without it, we cannot do anything. No amount of sacrifice, no amount of worship, no amount of service will ever amount to anything without this. Jesus says in John 
chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. Just as the Father abides in me, and I in him, so I will abide in you. In verse 5, then he states our significance. Now, we know that Jesus clarifies his significance. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, he, he states our significance. You are the salt of the earth. You are a light of the world. You are a city that is set on a hill. You are the branches. As the vine desires to produce fruit, His grace flows into us. But it's not just that His grace flows into us, His grace also flows through us. See, that's our significance. Now we are pointing to the vine for the entire world to see as they see our love. And they see the love of Christ as it is dwelling within us. In verse 7, he says, my words abide in you. He continues to go on to say, whatever you ask in my name, I will give it to you. He says that multiple times when he's with the disciples from chapter 13 to chapter 16, you ask in my name, I will give it to you. But I think it's significant here that he says, my words will abide in you. If you abide in the words of Christ and Christ's words abide in you, you, then you will know God's purposes for life. You will know His purpose for the world. And the prayers that you would offer would not be selfish in nature, but rather for the end purpose of God. Not my will, but yours be done. And yours is the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. And all glory belongs to you. We will pray for those things that we know that God wishes for us to pray. And then he says in verse 9, Abide in my love. As the Father has loved me, and I as I have loved the Father, so I have loved you. Now abide in my love. This is perfect love, folks. This is not just, you know, liking something, not having an affection for something. It says, this is your purpose. Go on to the next. By accepting our true worth in Jesus, these four things occur in our lives. We bear fruit. The only reason we bear fruit is because we are in the vine. He gives us the energy. He is the source of life. He is the source of vitality. It is necessary. Now, a person may bear fruits by knowing what is good and right, but nothing that is of quality in the sight of God we look in Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23, and Jesus says, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works? And Jesus, I never knew you. And you had no identity in me. You had no connection in me. And even as you did things in my name, I didn't recognize them. I recognize that they were good and your life can be blessed because you do what is good. But it's nothing. Unless it is in me and through me. And we know that we can glorify God. If you are a true disciple of Jesus, then your wish is to bring honor and glory to God. The primary purpose of our lives is to honor God and enjoy God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's your purpose. We know that our prayers will be answered, and we will be able to discover perfect love. Jesus says in verses 2 and 6, that the branches 
that go on their own, try to accomplish in life something, anything, without Jesus, do nothing but wither and die. They are good for nothing but for the fire. They're nothing but kindling. They fulfill no purpose. Now we recognized a while ago that a person does not have their new creation identity because without Jesus, the Father cannot give them that identity. And here in John chapter 15 and verses 1 through 11, we discover this, that without Jesus, you have no true worth. Again, I'm not saying that you are not worthy in what you do and who you are in this world. But without Jesus, you have no true original purpose worth. Because without Jesus, there is no real vision. There is no real knowledge. There is no real life, the way, the truth, and the life, to supply you with new creation purposes. So let's take a look at this, the identity and the purpose together. So without Jesus, Jesus has told His disciples, the ones who were to carry His name to the rest of the world, and whoever they carried the name to, if they believed in Him, that they would carry the name into the rest of the world. So this impacts us. Without Jesus, we have no new creation identity. We only become a part of the new creation and become new creation ourselves in Jesus. And with that identity, we're able to accomplish. We're able to fulfill our desires in bringing honor and glory to God by being able to bear fruit. For without Jesus... There is no new creation purpose. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and in Him was life, and He was the light of men. And He, the Word, became flesh. That whoever receives Him and believes in His name, He would give right to become the children of God. New creation. Who were born not of the flesh, not of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of blood, but born of God. Do you accept that truth about Jesus or do you reject it? Now, to accept that truth, first of all, is to deny the kingdom that is seized by self, living for me, that I find my significance in what I do or something else that is out in the world. It is to deny the identity sought by self. It is to deny the purpose developed by self. And it is to accept the kingdom, the way, the temple, the truth, the life, of Jesus, it is to accept the kingdom that was given by God to us. It is to accept that our true identity is not in what I pursue and what I make for myself, but what God has already given and made for me. It is to accept that I have a purpose in God's new creation. That I would 
would expound upon, a- explain the excellencies of Him who bought me, of Him who came down to me, who, to Him who chased after me, who relentlessly pursued after me. So are you going to reject that? Are you going to, to, to reject the life in order to chase after the life that, that you want, that provides you with fleeting happiness? Or will you accept and by faith be united in baptism to the one who gives life and gives it abundantly now. And in that life of abundance can give your life greater meaning and purpose. Purpose as God intended from the very beginning to be fruitful and to be in Him, connected to Him. If you're willing to accept that and you have not yet, would you please come while we stand and sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart.